So we are at the final session of the day, which is a plenary session. Uh, this will be co-chaired by Dr. Kanishka Di Silva and Dr. Nirosha Natulugama, consultant oncosurgeons. May I invite you to take your seats on stage? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and uh, let me introduce this uh, uh, speaker for the next session on uh, liver transplants. And you know, he has a special interest, uh, Professor Kito Fusai. He is actually a consultant hepatobiliary pancreatic surgeon in the liver unit at the Royal Free Hospital and at the Wellington Hospital in London, as well as an honorary senior lecturer at UCL. Uh, he is actually, his primary interests are in pancreatic cancer, liver meds, cholangiocarcinoma. And actually we are indebted to him because my co-chairman, is actually one of his trainees, and so uh, so uh, we, we we he's linked to Sri Lankan training system, and uh, uh, we welcome Professor Kito Fusai to educate us on this uh, complicated subject. Over to uh, Professor Kito Fusai. Thank you very much, Professor Kanti Pereira and Professor Jaya Tilaki, for the kind invitation to present uh, the Sri Lanka College of Oncology Symposium. My task today is uh, to give an overview on uh, the management of borderline resectable pancreatic cancer. I have no conflict of interest to declare. Approximately 10 per 100,000 people are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer every year. And uh, this at least in the, in the Western world and then the United States. And the late presentation is quite frequent, which accounts to the pretty dismal six months survival, partly also because uh, only few of these patients can benefit for surgical intervention. And these uh, at the expense of a high perioperative morbidity, albeit with a massively reduced perioperative mortality over the last two decades. And all these uh, for a relatively modest benefit in, uh, in overall survival. So in fact, only 15% or so of patients are operable at presentation with more than half presenting with a metastatic spread. The rest, approximately 30%, present with locally advanced disease. And this, over the years, over the last two decades, a new category has emerged of borderline resectable pancreatic cancer. And what is borderline resectable? Borderline resectable is defined as a tumors with some extent of vascular involvement. And it is important to define clearly what they are as we incur in the risk of, uh, of falsely classifying tumors as locally advanced. But it's important also to have a stringent criteria to define this group, to optimize the preoperative treatment, and also these tumors represent a perfect platform for new age advanced studies. Finally, it is crucial to standardize the criteria to define borderline acceptability, to provide a uniformity of service and the quality control. And finally, after many years of debate, we have uh, finally accepted uh, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network each, um, uh, criteria to define a borderline resectable disease. These criteria have been uh, more recently been adopted by the International Study Group for Pancreatic Surgery as well. So for portal vein and superior mesentery vein, any radiological distortion or narrowing of the vein is classified as borderline. But also a short occlusion of the vessel, as long as it's technically reconstructible, classifies borderline. In fact, any ab abutment of the vein up to 180 degrees is classified as resectable. Anything more than that is classified as borderline. With regard to the, the arterial structures, is a different story. For the hepatic artery, the encasement of the gastrodudinal artery up to the hepatic artery with either abutment or even a short segment encasement of the hepatic artery, but not extending to the celiac trunk, is regarded as borderline. For the superior mesenteric and the celiac artery, abutment should not exceed 180 degrees, respectively, for the SMA and for the celiac trunk, for the celiac trunk, obviously for body and tail or tumors only. So borderline can be venous and borderline can be arterial. 
This is an example of a patient who has got a short segment occlusion of the superior mesenteric vein, which was ultimately resected and reconstructed in block with the tumor. And this is a, an example of a patient who's got abutment of the superior mesenteric artery with a lack of plane between the vessel and the tumor. And why is it so important to distinguish? A few years ago, we formed the UK vascular section study group for pancreatic cancer and collected the retrospectively data of almost 1,600 patients undergoing a pancreatic duodenectomy for pancreatic cancer, dividing in standard pancreatic duodenectomy, 840 at the standard procedure, 230 at a pancreatic duodenectomy with a venous reconstruction, and 518 at a surgical bypass. And we use a specific this group as a surrogate of palliation. What we found is that the two resectional groups had almost identical survival, whereas the survival was much poorer in the surgical bypass group. And this was reflected in the median survival, which was 18 months, almost identical in fact, in the two resectional groups, but much, much worse of all the eight months in the surgical bypass group. And this at no expense in terms of perioperative mortality, which was very similar and not significantly different between the three groups. When it comes to arterial reconstruction and resection, the story is different. This is a meta-analysis and systematic review published a decade ago in 2011 by Molberg. What it showed is that patient undergoing a surgery and resection, pancreatic resection with an arterial reconstruction had a five times greater the risk of dying perioperatively when compared to patients undergoing a standard resection. For, in fact, not much benefit in terms of survival, which was much poorer in this group of patients compared to patients undergoing standard resection. Approximately a decade later, recently, a systematic review has shown more comforting results with a 17 months in terms of disease-free disease survival and with, a, a, in fact, a 17 uh, percent, three years, five years, three years survival in patients undergoing a pancreatic or duodenectomy with arterial resection, and most importantly, with a 5 percent perioperative mortality. The results certainly are better. But yet, the conclusion of the authors was that perhaps an arterial registry should be instituted to collect and capture prospectively what the results of arterial resection in this group of patients is like. We did indeed uh, present this study and uh, set up an arterial registry which was presented at the HBBA in Belgrade a few years ago. Unfortunately, it became more a tool for retrospective data collection than is a proper registry for prospective uh, data collection but maybe is a time to reinstate this. So not surprisingly, perhaps, over the years, surgeons and oncologists alike have tried to develop strategies to improve the outcome of patients with pancreatic cancer, and in particular, of patients with the borderline resectable pancreatic cancer. In this meta-analysis published the, the Amsterdam Medical Center group, they collected 38 studies of almost 3,500 patients, of which half of them had a new adjuvant treatment. They found that there was indeed a difference in survival, almost 19 months in patients having a new adjuvant treatment compared to 15 months in those who had upfront surgery. But the most important thing is that the R0 rate and the lymph node rate were far more favorable in patients having a new adjuvant treatment. Yes, it was primarily from retrospective evidence. In this graphic, the size of the circle indicates the number of patients in the study. The color, red, indicates the retrospective. The, the yellow indicates prospective. And the blue, randomized trials. And as you can see, there are only a couple of them which were closed quite quickly. So 
the position in the graphic on the other hand indicates the survival. As you can see from here, the majority were retrospective. The survival was perhaps better with the new adjuvant treatment, but the evidence was relatively weak. In these studies, which was published recently by our group, this indicates probably the largest cohort of patients undergoing portal vein resection. And this is a spin-off study from a benchmark uh, project which was uh, carried out last year. It does include uh, more than a thousand patients uh, having portal mesenteric venous resection and found that patients who had a new adjuvant treatment, chemotherapy, chemoradiation, or sequential, had a, a far better survival than those who underwent surgery up front. But over the last couple of years, a couple of interesting studies have been presented and published. The ESPA-5 is a feasibility trial, which had as a primary endpoint recruitment and the resection rate. It did compare patient having surgery up front for borderline resectable disease, compare on a one-to-one -one randomization to patient having gemcitabine and capacitabine, chemoradiation or fulfirinox. Patients in this group were in stage S6 weeks, and if it's still borderline or in fact improved, they were explored with a view to resect. Those who were in the surgical group, they were explored. Obviously, those who couldn't be resected in either groups went on to a palliative treatment, whereas patients who had resection went on to have an adjuvant chemotherapy with a 5 view folinic acid or gemcitabine. The results were interesting because uh, there was a number of patients who required portal vein resection. The number of patients who obviously the majority had adjuvant treatment as well. But the interesting finding is that uh, the highest number of R0 resection was in patient having a chemo radiation. When it came to survival, there was a significant difference in the overall survival at one year, which was much better in the new adjuvant group. And when broken down by the type of resection, the winner was a fulfirinox, which a much higher um, survival rate at 20 year compared to the others, and certainly compared to surgery up front. In this other study published by the Dutch, the Priopank randomized control trial, 244 patients were recruited with other borderline or resectable disease, in fact. The primary endpoint was uh, the overall survival on intention to treat and compare patient with other surgery up front, followed by six cycles of gemcitabine as adjuvant treatment, or a combination of a new adjuvant gemcitabine, followed by chemo radiation with gemcitabine as a radiosensitizer, followed by one cycle of gemcitabine, presumably in the cool down period from chemo radiation, followed by surgery, followed by adjuvant chemotherapy. The interesting, it was interesting that there was inevitably a proportion of patients who dropped out because they progressed on chemotherapy or on chemo radiation. But their R0 resection rate was phenomenally different. In fact, was twice as high in the new adjuvant group with a 63% compared to 31% in the immediate surgery. And uh, while on an intention to treat, there was, a, there was a difference, but not significant. If uh, you look at the two curves in patients who had undergone resection, the difference in the median survival was again, quite phenomenal and uh, astonishing, 16.8 months versus 30 months in patient having new adjuvant treatment. This is another study which was equally published recently and address the value of uh, new adjuvant chemoradiation. These patients were recruited in fact, either to chemoradiation upfront, followed by surgery, followed by adjuvant gemcitabine, or surgery upfront, followed by chemoradiation, followed by adjuvant chemotherapy. The primary endpoint was a two year survival and this was significantly better in the new adjuvant chemoradiation group. 
with the median overall survival of 21 months compared to 12 months. The R0 resection was also incredibly higher, 51% compared to 26%. And when you look at on the patient who had been resected, not on an intention to treat, was 82% versus 33. And the final finding, which was also quite impressive, was the number of positive lymph nodes in the new age of chemo radiation group was a 29% compared to 83%. So the approach of using both chemotherapy and chemo radiation has always been fascinating. It is certainly the way we, we practice for patients with borderline resectable, and is a way they do at the Massachusetts General Hospital. In these slides, in the next few slides, which are courtesy of Professor Christina Ferrone from MGH, they show the results of a phase two clinical trial where new adjuvant therapy with fulfirinox was followed by individualized chemo radiation with, for borderline resectable pancreatic cancer. A cycles of fulfirinox followed by individualized SBRT, followed by surgery. And the primary endpoint was the R0 resection rate. 48 patients were recruited into the trial. A proportion, nine of them, progressed or dropped out. Of the 39 patients who were ultimately explored, 40 had metastatic disease, and three had a local advance and were irradiated intraoperatively. But the phenomenally interesting finding is that of the 32 patients who were resected, 31, so 97%, had an R0 resection. And this is reflected in the survival. We showed a two years disease-free survival of 55% and a two years overall survival of 72%. So pretty impressive survival data. This is uh, exactly the same way we practice, although we don't individualize our chemo radiation. And these are two cases for your benefit. This is a 72 year old lady presented with the local advanced pancreatic cancer. She went through the same algorithm and treatment plan as for a scallop one trial, as she was thought to be inoperable. And then uh, after 12 months, she remained stable, having had the gemcitabine and capacitabine followed by chemo radiation. FCA 99 was normal. She had a, a Whipple's pancreatic duodenectomy without any need for vascular extraction. And it was a PT, PT0 N0 MX, so complete pathological response. Unfortunately, she recurred after 24 months, but she's alive at almost three years. And this is another case of a 65-year-old gentleman who presented again with borderline resectable. And uh, as you can see from the slide, abutment, quite long abutment of the root of the superior mesenteric artery near to the aorta. He had a fulfilling for three months, followed by chemo radiation with the capacitabin, followed by a Whipple's with the portal vein reconstruction using an interposition graft. The final stage at, from the histopathologist was a PT2 N0 MX, but a one, less than a millimeter from the margin, but is alive and this is free at one, one year. And why is it so important that we have a control, a local control on this tumor. It is important because uh, these are tumors which are more difficult to resect and the adequate clearance has to go hand in hand with the systemic treatment or with the chemo radiation. For this reason, over the years, surgeons have developed a number of uh, surgical techniques and approach which are important. The artery first is important because uh, you separate the tumor, and in particular, the ancillary process from the artery. In this slide, what you can see is how a surgeon can approach the superior mesenteric artery, which is a vessel most frequently involved, either from median or from the back or from lateral. In the second picture here, you can see the superior mesenteric artery running on the back of the pancreas, which has to be isolated and separated from the tumor. And this is what looks like in real life with the SMA, superior mesenteric artery origin, 
isolated and controlled from, the, from its origin at the aorta. And it is important to have a, a, a very clear and radical resection because we know now that the resection margin status is a powerful indicator and prognosticator. Although the definition of R0 versus R1 changes across the Atlantic, perhaps, or in Japan or in other places, it is important that you're as radical as radical can be, because in many studies, and certainly in the expert studies, the resection margin status was an important prognostic indicator. This is the results from the expert three, where you can see the patient where the tumor at the margin did much worse than those who had the tumor away from the margin. And this patient should also have adjuvant treatment. If it is true, the new adjuvant can confer a benefit in terms of radicality, which translates eventually in a benefit on survival. It is equally important the adjuvant chemotherapy is completed. The SPAC trials, one, three, and four, as well as the CONCO study, have clearly demonstrated the survival benefit. Until a few years ago, the standard of care had become gemcitabine and capecitabine together, which has shown an impressive 30% five-year survival in the treatment group from the SPAC4. The new study, which has been almost universally adopted in patients who are sufficiently fit to stand it, is uh, modified for Firinox from the Prodigy trial. It was compared to gemcitabine only and found to have a 63% three-year survival with the modified fulfirinox. This is what it was like. They randomized patients with R0 or R1, and uh, they obviously restaged it postoperatively. It was stratified by center and by resection margin status, uh, as it was a multi-center study, either to modify fulfirinox or gemcitabine. For both arms, they restaged at six months and the CT scan every three months. And what they found is that, not surprisingly, patients having fulfirinox coped worse and had more side effects than patients having gemcitabine, which is usually quite well tolerated. And, uh, and the relative dose intensity was better in the, the gemcitabine group. However, the survival, both the overall survival and the disease-free survival, was significantly better in the fulfirinox group with a 54 uh, months versus 35 months in the gemcitabine group, and with a three-year survival of 63% compared to 48 in the gemcitabine group. And on the disease-free survival, there was also a significant difference, 21 versus 12 months, and a two-year disease-free survival of 47 versus 30.7 in the gemcitabine group. So no doubt, New adjuvant is important, and the adjuvant systemic treatment is important. As you can see from this graphic, and this is a systematic review published by the Verona Group, it is clear that adjuvant chemotherapy is particularly valuable in patients who have an R0 resection. As you can see, the red line here is the one associated with the, the better survival, by far the better survival. However, this is not necessarily true for patients who have an R1 resection where the survival is worse, even with chemotherapy. So what is the role of uh, adjuvant chemoradiation? It's been extensively discussed and remains controversial. However, from this meta-analysis, you can see the patient who had uh, an R0 resection, they would do better without chemoradiation. But those who had uh, a positive margin and R1 resection, they do better than those who do not receive adjuvant chemoradiation. So in other words, if you have an R0 resection, adjuvant chemotherapy is a standard of care. If you have a, an R1 resection, you might want to combine R0 and R1, although it does remain far more controversial than systemic treatment only, and is only for discussion and as a suggestion, in fact. This is the last paper I want to present to you has been published recently. We have quite categorically said 
that there is a value, there is a benefit in treating patients with adjuvant treatment. However, this is a, a selected group of patients who in the era of Forfirinox have been treated with Forfirinox and upfront prior to surgery. The majority had a borderline resectable disease and includes a cohort of 536 patients from 31 centers in Europe. What they found is that in this patient, there was no significant benefit of treating them with adjuvant chemotherapy afterwards. However, this is not true for patients who had a lymph node involvement. Those from the subgroup analysis who had a positive lymph node in the resected specimen, they did much better with adjuvant chemotherapy than if they didn't receive it. Finally, we can do as much as we can as a surgeons, as oncologists, with the systemic chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and surgery. But there is a limit, and there is a limit which is also somehow induced by the biology of the tumor. This is a, a graphic and a pie chart taken from one of the studies from Professor Bianchin, who has pioneered the principle of molecular biology in pancreatic cancer in the UK and abroad. As you can see from here, the number of mutations expressed from pancreatic cancer is very variable. This is a tumor extremely pleomorphic, and the number of mutations from DDR, BRCA, BRAF, and the rest of it is enormous. Why is it so important to determine with the next generation sequencing this mutation? It is important because in approximately 10% of these patients, they, these are actionable, actionable in a different ways. Hence, it is vital to know what kind of mutation and if the patient expresses a particular mutation which could be targeted. The master protocol of the precision PANC, which is a, an umbrella study, aims exactly at identifying patients with pancreatic cancer who are screened, biopsied, and molecular profiling carried out and then eventually, based on the molecular profiling, there can be a role in different studies. The ARMS, PRIMA001 for metastatic, 002 for borderline resectable, 003 and so forth, represent the ARMS coming off the platform, which is precision PANC. The aims, the endpoints are different, but the principle, the fascinating principle of this uh, scientific approach is that you identify not the patient for that study, but that specific study for that specific patient. So you reverse, if you like, your approach to the treatment of this patient. And PRIMO002 in particular is a new adjuvant study comparing a Folfox and Abraxan as for the Brown protocol versus gemcitabine with Abraxan in resectable and borderline resectable pancreatic cancer. Patient with the disease, are staged extensively as, as by normal conventional pathway with a CT, MRI, US and biopsy. And this is the crucial part of it, which allows to have a next generation sequence characterization with a cancer gene panel. And then these patients are, are um, uh, randomized to other full fox, actually not randomized, but recruited to other full fox and Abraxin if the performance state is a zero to one and they are younger than 70, or gemcitabine and abraxin if the performance is worse or they are older than 70 years old. They are allowing it to have some radiotherapy followed by surgery, followed by adjuvant and follow-up. So no digression from what is a standard conventional pathway of these patients, but concentrating as an endpoint on overall survival, disease-free survival, the various response rates, as determined by CA99 and CT and PET, but also answering important research questions, such as the biomarkers, for instance, the mutation and the, the clonal evolution. So to assess whether the treatment has induced a change in the biology, in essence, and in the, ge in the genetic profile of the tumor after um, treatment. So in conclusion, it is essential to have one classification for borderline receptable pancreatic cancer and to use the same 
and the, the only um, definition and criteria. Venous resection should be the routine treatment everywhere a patient is treated, whereas arterial resection should only perform in highly selected cases and in an extremely um, uh, competent and uh, experienced centers by experienced surgeons. New adjuvant treatment, we can say now safely, provides a better outcome for borderline resectable and they should be adopted universally. Adjuvant chemotherapy also should remain the standard of care with the modified fulfirinox being associated with the best overall and disease-free survival. Finally, the benefit of adjuvant treatment is mainly, as we see, in R0 resection and the, a great effort should be made by the surgeon to accomplish this and also in uh, uh, patients uh, who have a uh, not positive disease, the benefit of adjuvant treatment is particularly manifest. Finally, there is a possible role for adjuvant chemoradiation in patients having an R1 resection, potentially, although much more controversial, and the uh, genomic specific treatment should represent the future of this management. Many thanks for your invitation and uh, I wish I could be there in person, but maybe next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof, for that lecture. That was a fascinating lecture, and I'm not, a, I'm not at a surprise at all. Uh, anyway, uh, so Prof was a really a, a great mentor when I was in UK, and uh, he was a great surgeon, great academic, and above all, a mesmerizing uh, human being. So, Prof, uh, I'm going to kick off with the first question. So, what would you do if there is uh, progression during new adjuvant treatment, and if the disease is still resectable? Would you go for resection, or what is the prognosis, what are the survival outcomes? Thank you very much for your nice words and comments, uh, Niroshan. And uh, uh, it's an interesting point, uh, what you are asking, uh, because uh, patients who progress on treatment, um, particularly on systemic uh, treatment with borderline uh, resectable disease, somehow they have declared themselves. If anything, we shouldn't see this uh, as a lost opportunity. I think we should see this uh, as an opportunity, in fact, to identify those, uh, hopefully the minority, who progress on treatment. And considering that pancreatic cancer is and remains a systemic disease, we save them an operation rather than the other way around. Okay, Prof. So, uh, what is your uh, standard protocol for borderline pancreatic cancer? Would you go for chemo radiation or is just chemotherapy? Is a, what is your protocol? Is a, it, yeah, it is different. Uh, we have uh, we share the same uh, protocol with uh, my colleagues in MGH. Somehow, is a sequential uh, treatment of. Uh, three months of fulfirinox in patients who have uh, uh, were sufficiently fit, followed by chemo radiation, 50 gray, uh, with uh, um, over six weeks, with uh, capacitabine as a radiosensitizer based on the scallop study. Um, however, for those patients who have a venous involvement, clearly the recent studies on uh, um, new adjuvant treatment have changed the algorithm. Until a few years ago, we were resecting them up front. Now, when they classify as borderline and they only have a venous involvement, I treat them with the systemic chemotherapy only and no chemo radiation. So to summarize, if there is an arterial involvement, so if there are borderline arterial, is a sequential chemo for three months, followed by chemo radiation for six weeks, one month to six weeks, cool down period, restage and surgery. Those who have only venous involvement, is uh, three months of systemic treatment and then surgery. Thank you. So uh, the next question uh, coming in is, uh, they're asking uh, what about the surgical mobility in terms of chemo upfront chemotherapy versus uh, chemo radiotherapy? Is there a difference? Um, there is no doubt that the chemo radiation induces some fibrosis and it can make surgery more challenging. This I think is a, is a kind of phenomenon observed in many other cancers. It's not an impossible thing though, and while it does increase uh, the complexity, in our experience has not increased the morbidity or certainly the mortality. 
after chemotherapy, if anything, if the tumor is uh, off the vessels, it may make things easier. It, it doesn't, I, we haven't compared the morbidity after chemotherapy or sequential chemo and chemo radiation. And uh, let's not forget that all patients who have uh, chemo radiation, they have chemotherapy before. So both groups will have uh, chemotherapy. A group, uh, uh, some of them will have a chemo radiation, and particularly those with arterial involvement. But we haven't seen an increased morbidity in this group. And uh, Prof, so what is the place of PET scan and uh, lapros staging laparoscopy in the workup? And when would you very, do that? Very good question. And as you know, having worked at the Royal Free, we do tend to laparoscope them. And the yield of peritoneal disease, especially in borderline resectable, is approximately 10%. So you save these patients an unnecessary laparotomy. Uh, whether we do it uh, at the time of the definitive surgery, or prior to that, during the workup, it depends on uh, logistics sometimes. The, the issue about PET is an important one. The PET PANK, the, uh, PANK PET study, the PET PANK study um, has clearly demonstrated that, that there was a change in the management in a significant proportion of patients. So the National Institute of Clinical Excellence guidelines are to do a PET scan on every single patient with pancreatic cancer who is uh, deemed operable or um, goes to theater. So we should uh, pet every single patient. There are, again, logistic difficulties. I do certainly scan every patient uh, or do a PET scan on every patient with a borderline resectable. Um, again, a question uh, coming in. Uh, they're asking about uh, the, the value of CA 19.9. Uh, how would you get that into the management protocols? Yeah, yeah, it is another very important question. And uh, um, as you know, CA99 is expressed in two thirds of patients with uh, uh, pancreatic cancer. So there is a proportion of them who do not secrete CA99, and hence you can't rely on it. But there is a concept of uh, biochemical borderline resectability. And certainly a very elevated borderline, a very elevated CN99 might indicate a micrometastatic disease, for instance. And there are centers in the world, some prestigious centers as well, where they regard a CN99 uh, greater than, I think, 1,500 or 2,000 as an absolute contraindication to proceed to surgery. We do use that, on the other hand, as a valid marker of response in patients with borderline resectable disease. What I started doing is not just monitoring the CN99, but also monitor the response in terms of avidity on the PET scan before and after new adjuvant treatment on a PET. Thank you, Prof. Uh, just one final question. This is not really related to borderline pancreatic cancer. Uh, patients with chronic pancreatitis coming with a distal CBD stricture, uh, you know, there are two groups. There are patients who are known to be chronic pancreatitis and coming with a distal CBD stricture or patients coming with a CBD stricture and then found to have chronic pancreatitis. Uh, you know, all, doing all these investigations, MRI, US guided, uh, I mean, doing an EUS, still you would not be able to differentiate whether it's a cancer or it's whether it's due to chronic pancreatitis. So how would you square this? Well, I think it's a, it's a minority probably and uh, rarely you, you come across uh, patients who have a chronic pancreatitis. More in fact, as we are digressing from the borderline subject, more, in fact, more and more you see patients with autoimmune pancreatitis which mimics uh, pancreatic cancer and, uh, and they are treated obviously accordingly. Just probably a couple of days ago, there was a patient who had been referred for second opinion who was uh, almost uh, about to go to theater for a Whipple. And thankfully we identified that uh, uh, this was in fact an autoimmune pancreatitis and uh, the patient uh, kept his head of pancreas and uh, hopefully much better quality of life. With regard to your question uh, on um, the, the chronic pancreatitis, how you do distinguish them? Yes, the, the algorithm is always the same and the investigations in your hands are always the same. You have a CT, you have an MR, you have an endoscopic ultrasound scan in particular and, uh, and uh, tumor markers. One of the difficulties also is uh, sometimes uh, to sample the right area. What we are trying to do, for instance, now is uh, to implement 
a pilot um, kind of protocol where the cytopathologist is on standby at the time of the US so that the multiple samples can be taken and the cytology reviewed uh, in real time. And they hopefully will increase the accuracy of the test and of uh, the, uh, the, the relevant uh, cytopathology report. But in, it remains a difficulty. Patient with a, a mass in the head of the pancreas, uh, just to, to summarize and wrap it up, has to be considered having a pancreatic cancer until proven otherwise. In my view, and this is perhaps a bit provocative, but if you're really stuck with your dilemma, it's better to put a patient through an operation for benign disease than uh, negate or deny an operation to a patient with cancer, if it makes sense. Thank you very much, Prof. That was a very informative session and hope to see you next time, next year in Sri Lanka in person. Thank you very thank much, Thank you Prof. very much, Nilo I really enjoyed it. And thank you to everybody. Bye-bye.